All right. Yeah, no, that looks good. All right, members, today Sweeney here, and I'm uh, coming with – there we go. And I'm uh, here with Keith Baxter from Nothing Held Back. You may have heard him on the Nothing Held Back podcast. I've been seeing a lot of buzz about that. And he's very well known for his SEO, and he has also recently started a mastermind. I mean, this guy's been around for a while, pretty recognized face. If you're watching this interview, it's likely you've heard of him. And, uh, Keith, I want to welcome you. Appreciate you coming on. Sweeney, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor. And uh, he says he didn't know it was a hangout, so he says he looks a little little rough. I think he looks just fine, and I'm sure uh, our members won't mind. So I kind of want to lead this off. Obviously, you know, you are well known for your SEO. Sure. And, you know, it's changed a lot. I mean, when I first got into it six years ago, it, it seemed like it was easy. You could at least rank for some keywords and, and get some traffic. But, you know, that now you have a lot of people saying SEO is dead. You know, I saw in one of your emails. What's going on with SEO right now? Where's the focus at? What's working well for you? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that you mentioned this because, uh, you know, SEO has been, uh, you know, my bread and butter for a long time. You know, mind Joe, you know, I like predictable traffic through paid traffic as well, uh, obviously. But, um, you know, we've for the, the amount of work that I would put into it, just insane returns. And up until about probably November of 2013, so last November, uh, we just started seeing a lot of filters being implemented into Google. Uh, we were only concerned with Google, and it seemed like every other week that different properties were being hit to an extreme, to not so extreme, uh, some of them would, would raise up and there was just no rhyme or reason what was going on. And uh, about that point in time, I really had to do an evaluation and, and just say, you know, do I, am I going to continue to build sites? And mind you, the sites that I was building were very good sites. These weren't, you know, spam sites or anything. Uh, do I want to keep doing this or do I want to focus uh, on more of the parasite strategies where we know that these you know, Web 2.0 sites rank well, we'll get good content up there, we'll do some out-of-the-box type things, we'll focus a lot more on YouTube and Google Hangouts. Uh, and it was interesting, uh, when it comes to Google Hangouts, it's really getting a lot of buzz now as far as how well they rank. Uh, but we were doing it you know, six, seven months ago. Uh, there was a couple guys talking about it about that point in time, and we just jumped on to what they were doing. Uh, and for uh, one of the, my biggest markets is supplements uh, in the health space, and it could be just about any supplement. I could care less if there's traffic for it. We're going to hit it. And uh, we were just creating nice review-style Google Hangouts, uh, and we had a personality that, that would do the reviews, so it was never me. Uh, and she had a great voice. She looked good on video. She did a, a good job with review and stuff. And we would just slam it with spam links, man. I mean, I cannot say any. It's that's exactly what we did, and uh, we were ranking for all of the review terms, all of, all of the buy terms, uh, everything that brought somebody into the buy into a buying mode. We were putting our review in front of them, and within days, we were on the first page of Google for most of the supplements that we were going after. And some of them would last. Some of them are still there. Uh, months in months later, uh, a lot of them would die off after a month if you know without consistent promotion. Uh, that's the thing about the spam properties. If you're not constantly hammering them, uh, you know they they die off fairly fast. So it's a, it's a churn and burn. About that point in time, I uh, realized that it's just more important to focus on uh, some of the pay traffic that we're good at. You know we're ramping our Facebook stuff back up. Uh, ramp it up and really get into video ads, which we talked a little bit about uh, before before this. We're still in that testing phase, uh, getting back into CPV advertising, and uh, you know Bing is also one or that that we're playing with. Our, our ad budgets of Bing aren't large at this point in time, but uh, it's good enough that it's you know it, it provides a nice little living. Um, and SEO is still there. I, the Issues I have with it is even as we speak right now, there is another big update going on, and you know there's some speculation as to what it's hitting. And the reality is, and for for another two or three weeks, nobody's really going to know what's happening. So uh, that's one one big thing to take away from this. If anybody comes at at you on Monday and says I've cracked the code, I know what's working and not working, they're full of it. 
They just don't know. Nobody's going to know until it really settles down. And then it's still speculation as to, you know, what it really is. But, uh, you know, the nice thing about SEO is that you could spend maybe $1,000 promoting a site with links and, and good quality content and make sixty or $70,000 uh, within three or four months on with that work. So uh, the return is astronomical, whereas with Facebook, our Facebook advertising, you know, we'll put a dollar in and maybe make a dollar twenty-five or dollar fifty out. I'm still surprised to hear some of these guys saying that they're, you know, putting a thousand dollars in and making two hundred fifty thousand bucks. I haven't seen that, uh, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. I I do question it though. <laughs> so, but yeah, depends, that, that's what we're at. Depends how high ticket you are and uh, how heavy you are on the phone. I would say. You know what? That's uh. You, so when I when I kind of jokingly said the two hundred fifty thousand, I'm talking about these Teespring guys that say that they'll spend a thousand fifteen hundred and make two hundred fifty thousand dollars in t-shirt sales. Mm -hmm. uh, I will publicly call BS on that. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, but uh, that's I just yeah. don't think that happens. The, the Teespring, like the guys that actually do it well, in our less shady, I would say, typically will show you and they're like, hey, if we can come back two to one, three to one, we're happy. Like. Two to one, you're you're very doing well. Three to one, you really hit it well on a campaign, and and sometimes you know you'll have those campaigns that sell 350 shirts or go a bit more viral, and and that's that happens. And a lot of you got to think too. Some of these guys already have these hundred thousand fan pages built up, so they're kind of leveraging that a bit, and they can kind of coast off of that. Well, so yes, and I agree with everything you just said, I, but I think there's a lot of deceptive advertising out there when it comes to you know, get rich overnight with Teespring when the reality is is that these guys did a lot of preparation going into it. They were already very smart Facebook marketers and two to one and three to one, I buy that every day. I mean, I can buy that. That's, that's, I get that. I've seen stuff like that. Uh, but, but, you know, 250 to one, that, that's, uh, you know, that's taking, that's taking it to the extreme in my opinion. Yeah, that's, that's when they're getting a bit flashy. So kind of bringing it back to SEO, we'll kind of focus on that for a bit, and then we'll kind of see what you're doing now. You did uh, mention um, what's working now, Google Hangouts, followed by press releases, followed by YouTube videos, and then you talk about the uh, Parasite sites. So can you kind of break down that process a little bit for us more? I mean, it, it, to me it sounds like with the Google Hangouts and with the YouTube videos, you're, quite, you're kind of... Uh, uh, washing your links clean, I would say. Like, you know, you're yeah, kind of yeah. using some well, dirty stuff. You know, it's, it's real simple. So with the Google Hangout, I'll use a lot of spam links. And we'll use, uh, you know, Scrapebox, XRummer, GSA, any spam tool. Uh, you know, you can actually, if you just look in your spam box, you're probably getting three or four of these advertisements a day for uh, VPS servers that have a whole bunch of spam tools built into it. I have several accounts there. Um, I'll run it myself. I'll hi hire uh, Fiverr guys to do it. I have a VA that also runs these tools, and we just crank out links all day long. If a property gets killed or a YouTube account gets killed, so be it. Uh, it's just the cost of doing business. But with that being said, we're able to do that more with Google Hangout videos than we are with YouTube videos, and that, to me it doesn't make much sense, but that's it's the way it is. So uh, I'm finding that if we get really spammy with our YouTube stuff, our accounts are shut down quickly. Even if we have great videos in there, like our review videos, if you ran across one of our review videos, they're not cookie cutter. They're three to seven minutes long, and they give legit content about the product that we're promoting. So you know, on a scale of one to ten, these are eights. I mean, they're good videos. Yeah. Um, with that being said, with our YouTube videos, especially the ones that are uh, – that are good reviews and aren't the Hangouts. Uh, our main promotional strategies with those is with press releases. And then we'll take our press release links and we'll run those through uh, a system called Link Emperor, which is just another spam tool. Uh, but it's it's very simple, uh, it's very effective, and it's uh, it's quick. You know, one of the things that uh, is really important going into this is the research side of it. If you're getting your keywords wrong or you're promoting a product that doesn't have some kind of brand recognition already or they're not doing a lot of mass media buys online and offline, uh, then you're having to go with more generic terms and educate people into the buying process, which is not what I want to do. So one of our criteria is, is how big is the ad budget that we can ourselves, just through a little bit of research, how big of an ad budget do they have? 
you know, does AdBeat show that they have a lot of creative on a lot of different, uh, you know, a lot of different properties? What, what does their ad creative look like? Is it very aggressive? Well, the, the wordier and more aggressive they get with their advertising, I'm going to do a lot of the same stuff with our reviews. So uh, we're going to touch on a lot of those pain points that we're finding just through uh, ad, it's A-D-B-E-A-T dot com, ad beat. Being in Texas, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the things that I, I say is a little more difficult to understand, but that's all right. That's just my accent. So A little bit of draw. Yeah. So, yeah. So, that, yeah. So then this strategy, it sounds like it's kind of more on a kind of affiliate basis then, or? Yeah, everything's, we do have, we have started our own supplement line. Uh, I don't want to get into that simply because every time that I have announced uh, publicly a product that I've done, I've had a lot of knockoffs. We had a, uh, a big press release course out about two, maybe two and a half years ago now. As soon as we came out with it, there were three or four other guys that, that did the exact same thing. So we have a pretty unique supplement. Uh, that's out there, uh, still in the testing phase, still, you know, we're only selling maybe 10, 15 bottles a day at this point in time, so it's not big. Uh, we're just trying to, uh, you know, dial in our market and figure out exactly what our message is. And that's another thing. Uh, whether it be an affiliate or a product owner, the testing phase is everything. And I could care less if I'm losing, losing money. It's, I just want a lot of data so I can make more intelligent decisions. And you know, at one out of maybe 20 campaigns right out of the gate, you know, really hits a big, but every, you know, most of them fail at first until we get our messaging right. And, you know, there's a lot of other marketers that may do a lot better than that right out of the gate, and that's fine. Uh, but, you know, when we do get our marketing right, we usually win. Uh, it's just there's a lot that goes into that. And, and one of the other things is the amount of money we're willing to spend before we call it a loser uh, is usually a lot more than other people too. Uh, let me give you a great example, and, and it's it's probably the biggest. Oh, and it just happened. Uh, it's actually, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if my facial expressions given away or not, but it was a huge disappointment. I, so I've been doing this stuff for 16 years, and been very fortunate and very lucky to be able to do this for that long. The one thing that got to me that I did not realize, and luckily I've learned this lesson, is that. After 16 years, I, I let my ego get the better of me, and I said that I, you know, I've had all these successes. I've done all. I know the systems. I can do this, and uh, I went about and created a company selling hot sauces, and selling salsa, and selling barbecue sauce. Put a lot of money into it, and had about four dollars bo per bottle uh, in profit built into it. Had my business plan laid out. Had we had. Uh, parties at uh, Salt Lake Barbecue uh, in outside of Austin, Texas. We had uh, just we had several parties, as a matter of fact, just to get the word out there, get a little bit of press. Uh, did a lot of press releases, spent a lot of money on advertising. Could never ever make it work. And uh, after eight months of losing campaign after losing campaign after losing, and, and, and mind you. We even went as far as, you know, put everything up on Amazon. We're going to do it the Amazon way. You know, there's these guys out there teaching these big Amazon courses. And, you know, they were, you know, we're making $500,000 a month selling stuff on Amazon. I'm like, well, okay, well, if this just helps me turn this around and stop draining my, my uh, you know, my pocketbook, I'm happy. Well, my biggest week on Amazon was about one bottle per week of each of the four products. Uh and our Facebook campaigns, I don't even want to tell you those numbers. It was beyond ridiculously bad. Uh, the SEO campaign by itself was a little over 10000 bucks, and uh, we didn't break into the top 100 for any of the terms that we were going for. So uh, it was a major – I mean, it was to the point where I sat down with my wife and said, you know – if this has been eight months, you know, we've been, I've been working this this for eight months. I've pat, and mind you, my a, a big chunk of my income is through consulting gigs with you know large corporations, and uh, that's what I enjoy doing. You know, I I passed on every consulting gig that came my way uh, to the point where I wasn't even being offered anything. People weren't even approaching me at this point, so I had really lost on a lot of you know future opportunity, and uh, finally I had to shut it down. And just say you know I'm not going to make the money back and there it is. So big lesson there, don't let your ego get the better of you. Always listen to the numbers. 
Uh, and if you think you can tackle a market that you don't have real data on, uh, just don't. Um, you know, and, and mind you, you know, we just shut this down a couple months ago, and I'd say for the first month after that, uh, I was gun shy on everything. And it's just I'm just now getting back. And uh, you know, it's it's uh, you know, affiliate marketing. Your own products can be extraordinarily lucrative. I mean, you know, like I said, I've been doing this for 16 years. I, I thoroughly enjoy this stuff, uh, but. Uh, you're going to have mistakes along the way, and you just have to own up and suck it up and keep going on, uh, regardless of how much money you lose in the deal uh, or how strange your marriage might become <laughs> because of all the money you're losing. So yeah, that's uh, so yeah, that's uh, that that's those are some lessons right there. Now, so I'm curious. This kind of brings up uh, two questions. Now, one is kind of why it didn't succeed, and the other is. And this gets brought up a lot in different entrepreneur things: is how do you decide if something is a loser? You know, like no, where yeah. where is that line? You know, is it a certain amount of money? Is it a certain amount of data? Like when do you when do you fold them? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Let's start with the first one. Um, I ended up hiring three different consultants uh, because I I had gotten to the point where I just wasn't able to figure it out. So I said, well, I need to bring in some some other eyes and it came down to it that uh, and it's obvious to say it now but it wasn't obvious when I was involved with it is that I was selling a consumable that somebody could easily walk into a grocery store most people aren't tied into a brand and those that are tied into a brand are very it's a very very small amount of people uh, and those that are tied into a brand would rather go to a specialty store store than go to get it online so while we had all of these ads out there and while we were, you know, creating a lot of social buzz uh, to the point where we almost hired, I mean, and I'm very glad that I didn't because uh, it would have cost a, an, an extra chunk of change. Is uh, We were going to hire a social media company to do some real social promotions for us, not, you know, what we as Internet marketers consider social promotions. But we're talking about, you know, big stuff, getting involved with, you know, major brands and tying the two together and stuff like that. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, a big lesson there was even though I my ego got the better of me, at one point I realized that I did not know better and needed to bring in other eyeballs to do it. And that's, you know, when I do my consulting, that's why they bring me in too is because I'm able to see holes that they're not able to see themselves. And when you're involved with your own project, it's sometimes you get so involved and so close to it that it's hard to see the force of the trees. So... It is, uh, you know, that that was a big one. That was a big lesson. And then uh, I, you know, from when do you know to stop, I wish I had a metric for that. For me, I waited three months too long and kept, you know, thinking that I could throw more money and more money at it. Finally, when it got to the point where I'd thrown so much money at it and it wasn't working uh, at all, uh, that was a point in time that I said, okay, enough's enough. I'm not making this back. I just need to suck it up as a loss. Um, had a lot of inventory that was destroyed, uh, and then I had to pay for them to destroy it. So, you you know, it was just, <laughs> yeah. yes. it was just a bad situation all the way around. But it was, uh, I think, yeah, too, it is what it is. So, with what you said with sauces, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I, I don't even if the margins are there, it doesn't seem like the kind of thing that you can really use these direct response tactics that we're used to, you know, on the internet and that we're kind of trained in to work. And I think you might have been a bit too ahead of your time. I would say three years from now, when Amazon Local is delivering my groceries to my door, then the hot sauce I buy, you know, I mean, I go from having the five options or the 20 options at Publix to 100 options then I might be more open to like, well, hey, this black label sauce, I've seen them before. You know, let's let's try that one. Well, brother, this is this is it. Ego. Ego got the better of me, man. What you said right here is obvious. I mean, this is obvious. But when you, when your ego is so tied into something, you at least for me, I thought that I could just make it work regardless. And it's you know, not being involved or tied into it or being passionate about it as an outside observer, it's very easy to look at a project and say, well, like, duh, I, I, mean, I know why it doesn't make sense. And I get that now. Uh, 
I, I was sitting on a high horse, you know, we'd just come off of a few really successful campaigns, and I was like, man, everything I'm touching turns to gold, and it's, it, and it doesn't, and so, you know, this is the world's, the universe, God, however you want to express its way of saying, it, you don't, everything you touch doesn't turn to gold, you need to freaking realize it, so that was, uh, that was a big one, so luckily, you know, I, the lessons that came out of it, you know, you grow as a person, you know, I'm 42 years old, had uh, a good life and had some ups and ups, ups and downs, and, and I think that you know my ups is time for a little bit of ebb and flow, and it just needed to happen that way. And yeah, I'm glad it did. You know, I'm sad it did, but I'm glad it did because uh, the stuff that I'm involved with now is much more data driven, uh, much more analytical going into it, uh, and I'm passing on a lot of opportunities that, while it sounds really cool and the, the pitches made to me are just amazing. The numbers don't add up, and uh, it even goes beyond just common sense. It's just the numbers don't work. So it's uh, so yeah. So it, it's it's been interesting, and then that you know kind of led into nothing held back, and you know the desire to give back as opposed to being a taker. You know through just running my own stuff all the time. So so since we're on the subject, um, nothing held back podcast. You're at about 19 episodes now. Yep, yep, we'll be uh, hitting 20. I was hoping to do 20 this morning, but I had this crazy urge to, to get a great workout in today, and so I just spent the better part of the day just in the gym. <laughs> so, well, I, I don't, I mean, obviously I don't want to uh, uh, spoil this interview, but uh, the, the Black Label Sauces one, I, I could see that being a good one if you if you just did a full full one just on like, hey, this is one of my big failures, and this is what I learned from it. Because people like that kind of raw honesty on podcasts, especially, I would say. But you know what? I'm going to take your advice on that because you're right. Just as in, you know, me expressing it to you, you know, a lot of things, it's uh, it needs to be it needs to be said. Uh, you know, people just need to realize that this is a business, and you know, so many internet marketers, and I don't blame them because it, you know, hype sells. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. Hype sells, uh, but so many internet marketers make people who are miserable in their jobs or their lives believe that the you know the internet is just the pathway to riches without much effort and just like any business it's it's not I mean, it, in many cases it requires a lot more dedication and discipline uh, you know for instance I work from home yeah I have people that work for me but it is a lonely existence at times man there's days that if I don't get out of the house I am going to go crazy and you know you don't get that when you're working in a job where you're surrounded by people and you actually have a social life. So it's a, in my opinion, uh, when you figure it out, you will have enough successes to make it well worth it. And if you have a lifestyle associated with it, uh, so you know a lot of these guys are single. I'm married with two kids, so it doesn't really work that well for me. But uh, you know, a lot of these guys that are single, you know, they're traveling to Asia, they're traveling to Europe, they're traveling to Mexico and Canada and South America, and they're living the, the you know, quote unquote, internet lifestyle, and that is a beautiful thing. And but if you're not able to do that, uh, like in my situation, it's not that I'm not able to do that, but you know, my kids go to private school here, and you know, school years out of the question in traveling unless I'm doing it myself, and I don't want to travel without them, so it's a uh, it's just different, and it can be lonely, and it can be you have to be a self motivator. And as, as a matter of fact, you know, this is an, a little side. Uh, there's an underground movement with uh, you know supplements, you know, mainly known as nootropics. In, in, they're so big in the internet internet world, uh, you know, just through internet entrepreneurs, that a lot of guys are taking these just so they can stay focused throughout the day. Uh, you know uh, whether or not you believe ADD is a real you know condition. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, so I don't know. But I will say that you know a lot of these guys using the RAS TAMs and the nootropics uh, supplementation are able to then focus longer throughout the day. So it's there's a whole there's subcultures within the subculture, and that's one of them. So it's kind of interesting. I guess that was a little rant. Is your is your supplement a uh, nootropic or no? No. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay. Yeah, I've used uh, Rastams before personally. Um, I'm I'm a little weird when it comes to even caffeine, any kind of uh, quote unquote like upper, just any kind of stimulant really affects me. I'm very sensitive to it, so I have to watch that anything I take because you know I'll, I'll get more jittery than you know some other people might. It works for them, but for me typically it doesn't. 
So I, I have to like watch myself with these different kind of things. I get it, man. And you know, I have to you know admit, I'm glad I don't do have access or know anybody that has access to cocaine because that jitteriness that, that you talk about and a lot of the rastams, especially combined with caffeine, gives you a crazy rush. And it's uh, I enjoy it. It's I don't I can't use it all the time. Uh, it also gives me headaches, which eh, that might not be a good sign. But it's uh, you know at the same time it's it helps on those days if I'm writing copy and you know that's what I do. If I if somebody says what do you do, Keith? You know earlier you said you know you're known for SEO. If you were to ask me what I do, I write email copy. That is what I do. I write emails all day long, and I write emails and I mail them to different lists. That is my job. And uh, but it's uh, and so a lot of these videos and stuff, you know, we'll send people to a lander even before we get them into the affiliate promotion because I've written enough emails to then, you know, sell the actual product. A lot of people won't buy it just off of a review, but they will buy off the pre-sales that we continue to send them over and over again. So that's uh, so I write emails, man. I am a copywriter. Uh, I can't write long copy. I don't. I'm not very good at VSLs, but I'm good at emails. And uh, so yeah, if you're going to master any skill, master master email writing or pre-sell writing or copywriting before you ever get into traffic. Yeah, it, it, I, I remember hearing uh, Justin Brooke also, he was talking on uh, I Am Party and he was saying a lot of people think they have a traffic problem, but what they have is a conversion problem. Because if you're converting high enough, I mean, you can afford any traffic, so to speak. It's that, The traffic side of the equation becomes very easy if the conversion side of the equation is favorable. There is a caveat to that, and, and uh, the caveat is, is that not all traffic sources are created equal, and some really suck, and it doesn't matter how good your conversions are. If you're hitting the wrong source, it's hitting the wrong type of person. Uh, like any, any like CPV advertising, for instance. Uh, some people call it PPV, you know, pay-per-view. You know, it's traditionally known as cost-per-view advertising. Uh, people come into those networks... Uh, generally through free downloads and toolbars and st stuff like that. And there's a couple networks that have integrity in the way that they go about getting those people, and you can actually convert with those. Uh, but there's a lot of networks that go at it with no integrity, and uh, it might be the flavor of, yeah, I don't know, CPV hasn't been the flavor of the day for a while, but uh, next time it is the flavor of the day, it doesn't matter how good your copy is, uh, how good your pre-sell is. If that particular traffic source sucks, uh, there you go. But then that's why that's why Google AdWords is still the king. It's still king. Google AdWords is king. It's expensive, but it's king. Uh, that's why Facebook advertising. If you understand the dynamics of Facebook, uh, and that it's a social space, and that's what you're getting involved with, uh, then it's highly effective. Video ads. You know, I love video ads because we create freaking video reviews, man. So I mean, that's that's exciting to me. I can get a lot more eyeballs to the actual reviews. The targeting is a little more difficult, and there are a couple guys out there that are really good at it, and I'm still learning from. Uh, but that's uh, that's interesting. Bing, uh, it's second to Google. Uh, it, it crappier interface, in my opinion, uh, but the quality is there if the if what you're targeting has traffic, which is uh, can be difficult on Bing as well. But it's uh, so yes. I take Justin's, it you haven't uh, done anything with Twitter then. I have not. I have not. As a matter of fact, I just got a video from a guy named Gower Chaudhry about Twitter advertising. Now, I've done native advertising uh, through Outbrain and stuff. You know, one of the going back to SEO, uh, one of the factors in SEO that not a lot of people know is the more traffic you have, the better rankings you're going to have. Well, it's kind of a catch-22. Well, how do you get more traffic if you don't have the rankings? Well, one way that you can you know, boot, you know, boost that is through native advertising on, you know, places like Outbrain. So we'll run a campaign, you know, 10 to 15 cent clicks on some really good curated content that our writers wrote, uh, get a couple thousand uh, visitors in fairly short order because those, you know, Outbrain syndicates through Forbes and a few other, you know, sites like that. So uh, we're able to get a lot of uh, traffic quickly, which is a ranking factor, which helps our overall site. So, you know, going back to SEO, I know we're kind of jumping all over, but now ah, we're talking. It's good. This, ha this is how the paid trap, the paid advertising, ties back into the SEO, that then ties into the monetization. So it all works out, man. It's 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 a big circle. 
No, it, it's all connected. I mean, it, at the end of the day, the better you can try to understand more of the process. I mean, like you said, there's crappy traffic, there's crappy conversions, there's an in-between, and, and figuring out the flow. Um, obviously, if you're a good email copywriter, that's also going to help out your offer. Um, yeah, so I'm curious. Uh, that, that's a pretty interesting little hack there. So what? You, so kind of give me a more strategic. You will try to get a certain amount of visitors in a very small amount of time, or just yeah, to, yeah. So to let, some let, love. Let, let me let me first go over, and this might be changing as of something that I saw just yesterday. So my my typical site uh, is made up of 32 pieces of curated content and eight reviews. Uh, and then coming into those reviews, each review also has generally, uh, you know, 20-ish videos associated with it. You know, pre-sell. You know, some of those are spam videos. A few really good ones uh, done by Mia, who's the lady that, that does our reviews, uh, our video reviews. So that's our traditional setup. Um, the curated posts are brought in at two per week, so we run those for about four months. Uh, before we stop the campaign and then after that each month we'll generally refresh the content not through new content but simply adding a video uh, an embed video from YouTube into the content just to give it a fresh date so that's our typical site setup uh, and then we have interlinking there but we, we won't get into that um, and then to jumpstart it uh, we'll generally use some link pyramids and some outbrain so the link pyramids are to bring some uh, four or five really high quality Web 2.0 links coming into the better curated stuff. Uh, none go into the to the reviews right in the beginning. Everything's going to the curated content because it's trendy. It's what people are searching for. It's the seven best destinations to uh, go on vacation in June. And here it is May. That's the kind of content that we're sending that traffic to. Then we'll use Outbrain uh, to get a lot of traffic really fast. Uh, if that traffic ever converts into building the list, which we oftentimes put our list builder uh, at the bottom of the content for a very specific reason. We want people to consume the content first before they opt in. Uh, it always leads to a higher quality opt-in, much lower opt-in rate. So people that are really stuck on numbers as opposed to quality will never like this. Uh, but with that being said, the people that do come on have consumed, they've stayed on site a little bit, they've opted in. They're more than likely, and we're you know now one of the things we're also doing now is on the content and reviews that's catching. We'll put retargeting code on each page, so we'll create in Facebook our retargeting lists uh, through custom audience, and that's a very very new addition to the system. Um, okay, and then as of a couple of days ago, I did a promotion for a guy. Uh, he had a piece of tech called. Uh, the P1 traffic machine got a lot of high, a lot of people mailing on it, and I said, "Well, okay, you know, it fits my model of building silos. Uh, it also fits a couple of other things, but it looks like a spam tool. So let's do a case study on it. Let's see what happens. We'll build out, build out a, an incredible silo structure. The, the content sucked, mind you. It's what's expected on a, a scraper anyway, but the actual silo part itself is very useful. The keywords that it pulled in initially uh, was." I've never seen something automated that, that did it that well. Uh, so, you know, if we use the, moving forward, there's a great chance, not totally stuck on it yet, the great chance we'll use that is setting up the initial silo, get our curated content written and put under each one of those. If that, as opposed to how I just described my sites, it will make for a much better structured site moving forward in, in much more of an automated fashion. So several years ago, I came out with a the, with the system called the Syndicator, which was exactly what I'm talking about now, but manual and a total PETA to implement. I mean, it was not easy. And so I see that through you know this new tech, the curation, the reviews, the videos, the jump-starting it with traffic, the really good links coming in, uh, that's another thing is it's very tempting to use spam links Things like uh, you know Link Emperor, and I love Link Emperor for it for its place, especially going to press releases and things like that. But using it to go into your site right from the get go is disaster waiting to happen. Uh, how do I know? Because that was our part of our process until all these little algorithmic and filter changes in Google started happening. And the only you know thing our content was great, our reviews were phenomenal. Uh, 
it's very expensive and very well written, uh, but the initial links coming in, you know, were two out of ten. So uh, that piece of the process has changed. And but you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, the speed of your site matters a lot. Uh, probably even more now after this latest 4.0 update. Uh, the the initial traffic surges are a huge. That is, in my opinion is probably the biggest ranking factor. If you did nothing but paid advertising to your site, nothing but paid advertising, no links, no nothing. I at least with a well structured site believe that you will get rankings just with that. So uh, you know, heck, if you're just starting a site on a brand new domain, don't even do any link building. Just use paid traffic. That's it. You're gonna, you know, we had just as an example of this, and it's uh, didn't realize this was the cause at the time, but hindsight's 2020. Uh, we had a health site and had a review on this site, and we just put Google uh, Google AdWords to it. Uh, we ended up that list from that site generated. We had over 220,000 people on that list at its high point. We had a big whopping nine percent conversion rate site wide with only two or three pages being the majority of that. Uh, so that was a lot of Google AdWords. But, the you know, every time we mailed that list, it made, you know, that was a healthy five-figure monthly site, and it was all built through paid traffic. So it was uh, an in in interesting way of looking at SEO, because the, that is SEO, even though it's paid traffic first, it ended up becoming just a beast in, in the search engines. So it ended up ranking very well. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. We ranked. As a matter of fact, we got cease and desist letters uh, from one company in particular, a very well-known brand. Uh, they were all over TV at the time, and we outranked their brand for their own brand name. So it was a uh, it was a nice little bragging thing, but uh, it was a uh, yeah. So that we sniped a lot of traffic for their brand name. Of course, they they did not like that. So <laughs> when, when an affiliate becomes too big, they get shot down, right? Uh, every time, every time, or they'll get screwed at one point in time or another. This actually, you this lends us into a great conversation. There are especially those doing CPA offers in the new tracking systems. Uh, they have so scrubbing is. Uh, the ability for a network or a, uh, uh, a merchant to remove leads that th either weren't quality uh, or were just bogus. So newer tracking softwares like Cake, the, mer the, the networks and the merchants can put in a percentage of leads, valid or not, that are just invalid. They just won't pay you for. So if they say 10% of the leads coming in, that's the, the metric that they put into the software. 10% of the leads, even if that 10% made them a ton of cash, guess what? You as the publisher are not getting paid. And that is a dirty little secret that the CPA know. I, and how do I know this? Well, I owned a CPA network for five years before I sold it. I am I know that industry, and uh, it's it's, a, it's dirty. It is a dirty, dirty business. Yeah, a lot of guys are making a lot of money with CPA. But the the amount of money that they that they've lost that they don't even know that they lost is usually pretty significant. So, so that's uh yeah. I think my son, as a matter of fact, uh, hey, I'm on the call right now, buddy. Go and shut the door. So this this is live, guys. <laughs> yeah. He just got well, for a second. I thought he was gonna be at the computer, and I'm like, I'm like, is he is he just hanging out in the background the whole time? No, no. So in my office, I have uh my one of my spam machines over here. Uh, has World of uh, Tanks on it, and he's 10 years old and is infatuated with uh, history. So he just comes and plays World of Tanks as soon as he gets home from school for about an hour before we start doing other stuff. But that's, uh, yeah, so he his routine is right now he comes in while Daddy's working. Hey, Daddy, can I play World of Tanks while you're there? Of course, come on in, bud. So. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I, I used to play a game, Pocket Tanks. Anyways, why do they, uh, so why do they scrub the 10%? Is there a... It just it's more money for them. Yeah. It is just more money for them. And now with the, I'm curious with the SEO. So you're telling us a bit about you know kind of your structure and how you set it up. If you had to do only clean SEO, so to speak, like what are your kind of best practices or tips there? 
So maybe someone that's not yeah. quite trying to do an affiliate site or anything anything dirty, but they just have a site or a blog that they are already generating traffic or doing paid traffic with, but they also want to make sure the SEO is kind of good. What's some kind of cleaner tactics? Maybe? Yeah, I'll tell you exactly. Hat. It's very, very simple. Uh, one, you have to have a couple dollars for this, but two, it's extraordinarily clean and works very, very well, especially for e-com, is I would go to POSI, P-O-S-I, rank, R-A-N-K, posirank.com. I would hire their uh, on-site consultant. I'd pay him, I think it's $500 for a monthly consultation with him. I'd pay him his 500 bucks. I'd have him analyze, determine what keywords I need to rank for, have him develop a plan, and then have PosiRank implement that plan. The first of the next month, I'd pay him 500 bucks to reevaluate the plan and set the next month moving forward. Then I'd pay for them to implement the linking plan that he comes up with, and I would just do that every single month. Uh, it's probably going to cost about $2,500 a month, maybe $1,500 a month, so it's not cheap, uh, but it's totally hands-off from you, and it's going to be the best links with the best design uh, that I think money can buy. So that's, you know, that's what I do. As a matter of fact, I mean, just so I, you know, I practice what I preach, uh, for a large corporation, we're setting up an e-com site for them, and that is exactly the plan, uh, albeit the price is going to be a little more expensive than what I just said, but that is how we're doing it, is they are going to determine where the targets are, and they're going to implement the targets. And this is the best uh, consult SEO consulting slash uh, links that money can buy. Now, if we're going to take it down a notch, so what's what's in the hundred to five hundred dollar range, and then what's yeah. in the kind of free okay. range? I mean, I'm sure there is content curated content. I mean, just yeah, one of the so things you said I, with the video to refresh the content. I mean, that's I, one of those. I would focus if I were to do it myself. I would focus on content, uh, either written by myself or paying somebody, you know, decent. I wouldn't go to I writers and pay twelve bucks for an article. I, you know, the quality articles I'm looking at are probably going to be in the thirty to fifty dollar range. I want good quality written content that has a little bit of research behind it, that has the ability to actually keep people on the site because, of course, on site is a ranking factor. So while it's not obvious, it's going to be a ranking factor that if people stay on the site and read that article. So it needs to be well written. It needs to be catchy. Uh, from that, I would spend a little money on Outbrain. I would get it approved on Outbrain.com and allow the web to do what it does. Uh, you're not manipulating anything. You're not even doing search engine optimization, per se. This is how the web's supposed to run. And just so happens to be a byproduct is the, the SEO benefits. To take that a step further, I would take the content and also have not, not one of these silly yeah, you've got systems that will automate this, but I'm not talking about that. I would convert the, uh, the article into a video, but like a legit video. And then I would also syndicate that out. Uh, the best way to do that is just a couple press releases to the video. That's all you really need to do. And you know, once that gets out there, that's going to give you links. And if it's a really good catchy topic, it's going to also get you some attention. And so what we're vying for are, are eyeballs. We're not buying, you know, I could say links all day long, and that's fine, but it's the eyeballs that we want. And this is a much more natural approach to getting eyeballs. Now, let's talk about the downsides to this. It's not guaranteed. L at least with links, I can know with a certain amount of certainty, a certain amount of certainty, <laughs> I, can know this, I can know with almost certainty what will happen or won't happen based on the actions that I take. So when I follow the natural web, uh, you don't know anything. Although, with that being said, through Outbrain, you are getting real eyeballs and you are paying for them, so it's it's paid traffic uh, with the side effect being SEO. With links, here's the problem. In We're recording this on the 23rd of May, 2014. As of today, using anything other than awesome links could get your site screwed before you even got started. Uh, and this is being said by a guy that's done a lot of spam over the years. So, uh, you know, th th those are the approaches that I would take. Now, of course, if we had this conversation a year ago, it would have been completely different. But it's it's not. So, gotcha. The other the other question, and I know this changes and can be uh, debated, but you're kind of the person to ask. Where does the social factor rank in? You know, when you're getting tweets to your article, when you're getting Facebook likes, if you're 
Facebook page has more likes? How does this getting comments on the page? Where are these social factors kind of fitting into the mix? Yeah. So again, curated content it works wonders for wonders for this. There, there's two types of social, man, and. Uh, I know this is going to sound silly, but you've got the manipulated social where I'm simply going out and buying likes that does nothing. Uh, some people says, say, will say it does. Uh, it's debatable in my opinion. But then you have the real social web sharing your content. Again, it's bringing eyeballs back, and because the content's good, it's getting shared more. That's a huge ranking factor. It's natural. And I think that it, you know, it's kind of the key word for the day. Uh, when it comes to ranking is, you know, how much can you play within the natural web and still manipulate it slightly through buying traffic uh, and or shared tr shared content? Well, that's done through excellent content. You know, right before summer, you talk about the best vacations, but you talk about the, the, the four most beautiful beaches in the world, you know, and, you know, or crazy airfare tips that will save you at least a hundred dollars per ticket. You know, things like that get shared, get passed around. Mm -hmm. you're, you're adding value, uh, and all of that. You don't have to write much of that. Most of that content's out there already, and you're simply citing sources, reliable sources of that. You're out, and you're even given, you know, uh, you know, attribution to those sources. So it's not even like you're stealing their content. You are saying, "I got this from Forbes.com. This is where I got it from," and you know, but the point is, is that you aggregated it, you curated it, you put it all together, you wrote your little spin to it, so it is yours, uh, and now that's what's getting passed around, and that on the social web is a powerful, powerful thing. Now, if I were to go out to any service that said, "Oh, I'll give you a thousand likes to your article," it's going to boost you in the search engines. Eh, that's that's debatable. I've seen it, yes, work, and I've seen it more often than not, not work. So uh, I can't definitively say that that would do anything for you anymore. This makes me wonder because part of Outbrain is, I mean, you're getting eyeballs, which is what you want, and you're kind of giving it that natural boost and that natural push. Um, I know Twitter, one of the things that people, you always have, you know, with any kind of social ads, there's always kind of this engagement side, and there's kind of the direct response side. So I know that Twitter, you can kind of play the engagement side a bit stronger. Obviously, that's a lot harder to game. So I, I think that's something that's, you know, interesting because you know, with a lot of this content you're talking about, especially if it is you know viral or wants to be shared, if you can get it in front of the right people and then it can kind of push it, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I mean, you, you that is the great interesting is the right word because it's not guaranteed, but if it does work, boy, you just stumbled on something awesome. And that's by the way, stumbled upon is another great place to use as a seed. It's five cents a click, ten cents a click. Uh, to get people to your to watch it, the problem is is that the way that they're watching it isn't necessarily the best way that they're watching it. Through Outbrain, they're clicking over to your site and reading it. Uh, through StumbleUpon, that's not necessarily how it happens. So, but yet it's another way. Now, so here's a question: with the content itself, do you ever retool it? So, content starts as top ten beach destinations, for example you're seeing that it's doing well. Do you go, hey, let's see if I can rewrite this headline or let's see if I can kind of alter the content in some way to have it produce better results or not? I have not, but I do know people that have and they do well with it. Uh, that goes into my lazy zone <laughs> a little bit. But yes, I have, I have heard uh, and I have seen validation that that works very well. Uh, I do not do that myself. But I think it's a wonderful idea, I mean, regardless. Well, that's something that I've always thought was interesting, you know, with, with so much kind of natural paid traffic, uh, social paid traffic, what have you, Outbrain especially, is that you can kind of test your content pieces. I know Upworthy does this, like, on an another level where they have, you know, this crazy machine that tests all these different headlines and titles and then picks the best one. And it's split testing headlines of, block of content, whereas mo normally people split test headlines of, paid ads. So it's like an interesting combination, but you, you got to think if you can hit the right headline and then it really takes off, obviously it's worth it 10 times so over. So that is real marketing. I mean, really. I mean, that it's, it's yes, it's easy for this, the small guy like myself to manipulate the ads and test that. That's easy. The content piece, it requires uh, a thorough analysis 
It requires a little bit of money, uh, and it requires some brain cells, man. I mean, it's it's fairly easy to write a short ad, but to come up with a take on a headline that oftentimes also requires a bit of a tweak on the content too. That's not easy, but Upworthy, I mean, good Lord, man. They're one of the top, I think, 30 sites on in the world now from this. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're, pro they're probably yeah. valued with a B. So, I mean, that's anybody that's valued with a B in the name, is a uh, that, that they've done something right. So what can you, uh, kind of shifting gears here a little bit, what can you tell us about uh, kind of your mastermind? Uh, have you always done masterminds? I know you have the Nothing Held Back mastermind. Yeah. Uh, what was kind of the idea? Yeah, it, obviously, masterminds are very popular. We've talked about it yeah, before. Over the last few years, so I, for the last six years, I've run different masterminds. I had probably the most well-known one in the SEO world, so that's kind of how the whole SEO thing got associated with me. Uh, all the top guys in SEO were part of that. Uh, we just disbanded that recently, but also in between that, I had one in health. I had a health mastermind for uh, entrepreneurs in the health space. Uh, I realized that running live events was my social space. Uh, I love to talk, uh, so and I'm you know I've spoken in enough seminars and conferences to be able to speak comfortably in front of large audiences. So it gives me the opportunity to speak in front of people, to interact with like-minded people. I'm pretty picky about who I let into these things. So the people that do come in are people that I want to be around with too. Uh, the difference between my mastermind and I would say most masterminds is that uh, while I could charge an arm and a leg for it, I don't. Uh, I'm more interested in the quality of person and what they can get from me and what I can get from them as opposed to you know line of my checkbook with you know a couple extra zeros. So uh, you know just for instance, my nothing held backs only twelve hundred dollars a year, but in the live events are only three hundred dollars for members and five hundred for non-members. So uh, I keep them at 20, 20 people per meeting. And uh, I bring in two guest speakers. Like just our first meeting, I had Perry Belcher, probably one of the best known guys in, in the business. He was one of the speakers. Kurt Malley was one of the speakers. This next one in July, uh, 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 Charles Kirkland is one of the speakers on media buying. And uh, Jesse Elder, who is you know, goes by the, the Action Philosopher, uh, he's one of the speakers. Guys changed my life personally. So, you know, I'm bringing in guys for speakers and then the actual round table uh, I have a very structure to tell everybody uh, you're coming into this mastermind round table with one objective your objective may be different but the one objective is what can you do what can you say to wow everybody else in the room and give them actionable content that they can take home and use today that's their objective now mind you what we get also in addition to that is what problems issues concerns do you have about your business that we as a group can help you address. But you come at it, I come at it with, how can you help everybody else in the room before we help you? Not that, that it has to be that way. It just, when it when it when we do it that way, it just works out because everybody's taking notes. If, if somebody got something that wowed them from you and then you present your problem, they are willing to bend over backwards to help you solve it. And every time we do this, uh, it's just rave reviews come in from it, and I love it from a selfish standpoint because it gives me so many testable things to come home with and say, man, now I've got a laundry list of stuff I can test and implement, and uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. So it sounds like you're doing them uh, in more of the traditional networking sense instead of as a product, you know. I yeah, think, yeah, I think that's the five thousand. Now, mind you, I, you know, I've been told Keith, you should be charged twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah, you know what? Maybe I should, but I would rather really get a corporate gig that that pays a lot more than that. That I consult with very, you know, it just implement strategy for them. Uh, that's that's more of an interest to me from a money making standpoint uh, than it is to the you know the mastermind pays for itself. Uh, it just pays for itself. It's pretty much all it does is pay for itself. But that's enough for me. You know, I'm happy with that. Uh, so yeah, it's you know, I, I see these guys. I mean, they're, I've seen masterminds now getting as you know rich as seventy-five thousand dollars a year just to be a part of it, and that's fine. But I, I think that while it does filter out people without money, I do think that people with not super rich checkbooks offer a lot of value that are is being overlooked simply because somebody has money. I've met a lot of stupid rich people. 
I, I, I truly have. Uh, but and I've met. A, well, and it seems like the people at the top aren't the ones that are hungry always, and they're not the ones that are going to be finding these new, quote unquote, secrets. Like like the next person to really break on t- Twitter traffic or YouTube traffic, or I mean any native ads, what what have you. It's probably going to be someone from the bottom. I would say. I would 100% agree with that across the board. Uh, I would much. I am much more excited to talk to somebody that's hungry than to talk to somebody that is arrogant and egotistical uh, because they have made it. And mind you, you know, I mean, there's a little self-reflection. I've been in that state, and that's not where I am now. You know, I am. I much prefer to surround myself with really cool people that want to make a difference. And you know, would come everything at everything with how can I help you? I mean, my next podcast. I know it's not the topic of this, but my next podcast is Ask Backs. It's let's let's help you. You know what? Let's help you. That's I think everybody could use a little bit of help. I know I you can use a lot of help a lot of times. So it's uh you know that's and I, I actually attribute a lot of this. I know a lot of people talk about it, but uh, Jesse Elders, you know, one of my mentors in this, and it's always about giving, giving, giving. And uh, even Jay Abraham and the strategy of uh, preeminence and, and going back to you know old direct mail days, what can I do for you? And then of course you know the you know the universe or nature brings it back to me. Well, the the funny thing about this is like kind of the basis of internet marketing is here's something for free, like like here's something for free first. Here's a video. Here's a PDF. Here's something that's gonna help you. And if this helped you, or if you want more of this, then sign up to my email list, and you can hear more about this. But it's here's this first. I used to be in the XBAC market, and I had a pretty big series of free videos. And you know, the first one I don't think was paid. And there's, and I heard tons of people that got their you know girlfriends back, their wives back, saved their marriage, like all these kind of things, just from like the first video, the first free video. You know, they might not even maybe they decided to opt in, but it's it's one of those things where like this was at the fundamental and it's kind of become so forgotten and it's it's easy to just say hey what's my lead magnet or what's my mastermind and like it it kind of becomes commercialized I don't know if that's the right word or you know too too well, corporate you just said something that I want I want to really I want to dig into what you just said because you you said it and didn't say it is. I don't know if this is necessarily true, but the first video that you had that helped so many people, you made when you have the intent of making money from that video, I think it comes through. But when you have the intent of helping somebody without really, I mean, not really giving a crap if you make money from it or not, there's a whole different level of energy that that, that is a, you know derived from that. And like your first one that you were just talking about, you just wanted to help people. Yeah, you were in the market, and yes, you wanted to make money. We get that. But I think that you had a legitimate desire to change people's worlds, and now, and when that did happen, you know things, you know things change. Things are just different. I, I don't know how to how to coach somebody on this, but the other than to say is give without ever expecting money in return. If they opt into your list for more information, I don't even know how to phrase that in a way that wouldn't come across as a money making venture. Uh, but I'm sure there's a way to, to do it. You know, I'm sure there is. I mean, I just off the top of my head, I don't know what it is. I, I know that you know in the personal development space, I have a whole lot of autoresponders that I've written in that space, uh, and most of the people that come in there are through contests and whatnot, not even from content. So it's yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's that, that's it'd be a neat area to really dive into at some point, and and maybe that's a, the next big two thousand or three thousand dollar course that's out there. How how to help people and then line your dollar? Yeah, I don't know. That's totally yeah. right. Well, it's it's kind of it's kind of Kernish a little bit. He talked about this with the whole core influence and results in advanced, and it's it's kind of hey, if you can get someone results without them ever buying or owing you anything, not even email opting in, but you can get them some sort of results. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to love you. From, look at Frank Kern, man. I mean, who wouldn't? There's people that would die for that dude. I mean. I'm, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, that's – and I, I knew Frank back in 2002 when he was just learning Camtasia. I mean, you're talking about a guy that I, I've, I've, I grew up with in this business, and now he is – I think he's beyond rock star status as far as he, – he's a legitimate – I don't know if gurus. I mean, but 
is you know if he told enough people to drink the drink the cool drink the Kool Aid, there's probably a good percentage that would. So he, he's a lot of respect for that man. He's he's done some pretty incredible things. Now he he actually does talk about consulting. So I just kind of want to ask you briefly on it. We'll see. Um, you you do mention consulting. Is there any kind of secret sauce there to how you're getting these gigs or how you manage them or you know Mostly anything in the process? Yeah, or? yeah all, everything that comes to me is through referral. So I, I don't market the, the service. I enjoy it because I'm very upfront. Whenever we're doing our first you know one or two calls together where they're thinking about hiring me, uh, I blow. I just like to blow them away. And you know I'll take a look at you know one of my strengths. I'm able to look at a plan. Uh, pick the holes in it, pick out what they're currently doing that could be done a little bit differently, uh, point that out to them, you know, show them examples of things that I've done in the past that totally related to that. And uh, it's it's interesting. It's To me, I'm able to play with other people's money on a grand scale, uh, so I'm not really limited. It, most of the people I take on are... are you know, nine-figure businesses. So I mean, they they have money to spend. Uh, the problem with that is getting in the door and getting the deal done, uh, and then getting things implemented uh, can be nothing short of a headache. So that is uh, that's some issues. But you don't need many of those. You know, I have two. I mean, that's and that's that's fine. But it's it's what I enjoy. It's uh, and it takes a great deal of time. So guys that call themselves consultants but take on 20 clients, I don't, I don't know how they can properly manage that. Uh, if they set the deal up properly, they're being rewarded monetarily uh, for what they put into it. But oftentimes, like myself, I put hours per day into each gig. So it's uh, in addition to my own stuff. So I mean, I, I'm not one of these guys that works. With, you know, I don't have a four-hour work week, man. I have, you know, set, I pass four hours before seven o'clock in the morning, man. <laughs> and so I mean, it's. You know, it's I, but I enjoy working, so it's uh, uh, yeah. So there we go. Is there any specific ways that you structure the deal, or it kind of depends on each? Uh, it's very dependent upon the, the company. Uh, ideally, ideally, uh, like the, the the typical structure that I want going into it uh, is generally going to be ten ten thousand dollars down, twenty five hundred dollars a month, and then a piece of the pie beyond the revenue that I'm you know the, their baseline. And a percentage beyond that, which is generally going to be 15 to 20 percent. Uh, if I can pull that off, that is the the ideal situation. Uh, most companies and most people will balk at that, and to track it is can be a bit of a nightmare. And oftentimes, when you start to kick gas for them and make, they make a lot of money, uh, they don't like to give you those checks. So, with that being said, if in, it's a very uh, sixth sense kind of thing if you if you feel if you feel them out when you're putting your proposal together that they're gonna balk on that I just raise my monthly up to five ten thousand dollars a month uh, in addition to the ten thousand down and that is uh, you know that that's how I structure it but more often than not and I've done this over I've had and I, and I say this you know from experience I you know I've done consulting for supplement companies in the past that uh, made a whole bunch of cash and you know the deal was I had 20% above the baseline, and a couple of them I never got paid. So it was you know a nice down payment, a pretty crappy monthly payment for the amount of work that went into it, and then not getting paid. Uh, you learn your lesson. So now I just structure it based on the sense that I have going into it, which is getting fairly refined at this stage in the game. Gotcha. Now uh, kind of a last. To send it off here, because time-wise, you know, I want to be respectful. You are doing more paid traffic, more uh, direct paid traffic. I mean, you're known as the SEO guy, and now you're getting into paid traffic. So, what are you kind of learning on this side, and what are you liking? You know, you t you mentioned Facebook, you mentioned Outbrain, you mentioned YouTube. Uh, okay. I mean, yeah. we've had a lot of people talk about Facebook. So, if you think you have a unique angle, hey, we're all ears. Well, so, so just so we know, people. So let me. Th this is going to have to get into my history a little bit. So mm -hmm. I, I have started and sold three companies. Uh, the first company I started in '98 and sold in 2003. 100% built on paid traffic, and all of that paid traffic was was just easing advertising at the time. I was just advertising in other people's easings. I was doing uh, in not solo ads, but legitimately putting. I was placing little tiny classified ads, man. Don Lupri 101, but online. Uh, 
so that was that was completely built that way. Uh, the second business was where I got to be known as an SEO guy is I bought a software company called Cloaking Master. I simply bought it. And but because I owned the company, I had to I had to understand and know the business. So what does any business owner do? They immerse themselves in the technology and learned it, thus setting myself up as an expert. Uh, so that's where the SEO side came from. But even that business was built 99% on affiliate traffic. So, but it was expensive. It was, I mean, just to get a license to Cloaking Master was three thousand down and three hundred a month. So, you know, that was referral traffic. And then the third business that I started and sold was called ModernClick.com. It was a CPA network. That was a hundred percent paid traffic. So, yes, I am known as an SEO guy. But every business that's been a real asset that has sold or done something of significance uh, has been one hundred percent built on paid. Uh, and whether that paid is, yeah, I would consider affiliate traffic paid. I mean, you're paying, you're paying for sale. It's the most beautiful traffic there is. It's not predictable. Uh, yeah. And I think that it's, the model itself has been bastardized greatly uh, from its original intent and the way that it's originally structured. Uh, but you know that in traditional advertising, man, I, I think native ads, and I, I think, and by native ads, I also think. You know, direct site ads are where it's at. If you if you know who your target market is and you know where they congregate, if they you know visit a specific site, radio show, and that radio show has a website, and that's your target market, that's that's where I prefer to be. Uh, and then through remnant space or, or aggregators, you know, the real time bidding platforms like Site Scout, I love that because I have the ability to find those type of places and and advertise. Uh, but beyond that, from a playing standpoint, an affiliate standpoint, I love Facebook. I think Facebook's great. Uh, is it the most effective? I don't think it's the most effective for 99% of the businesses out there. I think there's much more effective advertising. I think Google AdWords is still the king of the crop. You just have to suck it up and deal with uh, the initial blow of how much it's going to cost. Uh, but it's the most targeted advertising. It's tiny classified ads, man, on the biggest search engine that is hitting the exact demographic that you want because they're freaking searching for you. So you cannot get better advertising than that, in my opinion. I love CPV for the mass quantity that I can get, uh, and depending on how I'm using it, uh, can be highly uh, interesting. Uh, if you're using it for a list building, you know, of course, you're the guys that hype up the you know 90% opt-in rates and stuff. You know, suck it up, Buttercup. You know, deal with you know 0.50% opt-in and if you realize the the reality there then you're fine uh, but it's less than pennies to click so I'm, I love that uh, you know I, I'd say I'm spending the most of my time right now in both site scout and in Facebook so that that's what and I'm really really digging and love uh, and mind you Google AdWords and Bing I just in the marks that I'm in it's just expensive so I don't go all out on those uh, and the returns are about break even for the most part at this at this stage, uh, but I'm really getting into video ads because of all the videos we have out there and the amount of exposure and the underutilized uh, advertising uh, inventory that they have. It's cheap, so I think that the guys that are teaching effective YouTube strategies, YouTube YouTube advertising strategies, not uh, ranking a video, but the actual advertising strategies. I think those guys are setting themselves up pretty interesting right now uh, as to be the big future gurus in the next two years or so. I think that's going to be interesting. So, Yeah, something I've talked about a decent amount is uh, video ads on Facebook. You know, it's it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. And like we saw, you know, two weeks ago there was Progressive and another company that was all on Facebook, and I think it was like a million dollars a day or something ridiculous. But... Video ads for everyone, I'm sure, will slowly be coming. And video ads in general seem to be taking over the web a little bit. As more and more YouTube content's played, as we have Hulu and these other, you know, uh, these other video companies really taking dominance. It's just kind of like Pandora or Spotify or um, I forget the other one I listened to. How they have their little ads, I can see more and more kind of Hulu type sites or even Netflix. What if Netflix switched to a free model with ads? <laughs> like that's that's a lot of uh, inventory that it can open up. See, I, you're, I, 
my gut instinct says that you're dead on. I mean, that is as accurate as it is, and that is a. Uh, I'm right there with you, man. I. That's I see it too, man. That is uh, and that's where I'm trying to spend my money. It's a, uh, it's a trickier platform to do it well, but there's guys out there that have figured it out, and those are the guys that I'm turning to. So that's uh, I'll have it figured out and making decent money here pretty soon with it. I guarantee it. So. <laughs> Nice. Now, um, I mean, it, it kind of definitely makes sense for you too, since you're already doing video. I know for some people, if they aren't already doing video, it's a bit of a hurdle, and you got to play to your strengths too. At the end of the day, now you you talk about email copywriting a lot, so I kind of want to close out. Um, if you have any email copywriting tips or things that you've learned in uh, email writing or copywriting in general, yeah, yeah, don't be boring. Uh, one of my one of my big tips is I speak. An email as, or I write an email as I speak, and I think that's a big deal. I I, I think that that is uh, somebody's deciding to print while I'm sitting here. That's just funny. Um, yeah, you know everybody knows I'm on a webcast right now, but yet they continue to do this. It just cracks me up. But the the reality is is that uh, be real in your emails. Don't be cheesy. I think that that's disingenuous. I think following formulas is disingenuous. Uh, I think that if you, uh, I use the model of give first. I always like to give a tip in my emails, uh, and especially if it's a tip that they can use. I, I think that's huge, and I think that not a lot of people do it, or they try to do it and it's just cheesy. Um, just stay away from formulas, man. I mean, I think that there's overall formulas. Like, you know, one of the guys that I really enjoy reading is Ben Settle. Uh, he's an email guy. Uh, he's raw. My, a little too raw for most people, and I get that, but the fact that he tells it like it is and he's him in email uh, comes through, and I think that that is, you know, that's what I've always tried to do, and I think that that's, that I think your conversions will shoot up if you're able to do that, and you can speak about uh, whatever you're speaking about with some authority. You can't just, if you don't know anything about it, don't write about it. I mean, that's, it comes through as you just being a dork, man. I mean, don't do that, so... That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Appreciate you coming on. Um, people that want to find out more about you, I mean, your main thing, I believe, is nothing held back. Is there anything else you want to shout out, or what's the best way for someone nothing, to stock yeah. you? You know what? I just want some interaction. Nothingheldback.com. Come interact with me. That's a, let, let's talk. Let's have a, you know, let's play a game. Yeah, as, they, as they say in the old war games, say, let's play a game. Yeah, come on out there. Let's uh, listen to some podcasts and uh, comment. Let's talk. Go to my Facebook page. Let's talk about it. So nothingheldback.com. It says that the name is who I am. So <laughs> that's, that's it. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Sweeney. I appreciate you, man. You have a good day. You too.